So reverse isolation is, it's not, you know, typically they put you in isolation because you're infectious and they don't mm -hmm. want you to give something to somebody else. So with reverse isolation, it's that everybody else is sort of like whatever they might have. I'm the one who's, who's too weak whose mm. immune system is so weak that I could catch anything. Welcome to the Green Table Talk, where we will have open and honest discussion about transplant. That diagnosis, and I was started on the medications, you know, in my head I'm thinking, am I gonna be on this for the rest of my life? Like, spiritually, you know, I do believe in God. I do feel that faith. And you know, research supports that that people that have some kind of faith doesn't you know whether it doesn't matter what it is that you believe mm -hmm. in that people who have some kind of faith based practice that it does help with um, any type of disease. I'm your host Janine Johnson. Does lupus typically does lupus typically um, affect the process of, of having children? Like does. Does it make it more difficult or? So pregnancy is actually a huge stressor on a woman's body. Welcome to the Green Table Talk. I am our host, Janine Johnson. Today we have my friend Miriam on the show. Miriam, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I am extremely excited to be here because you and I are one in the same. Today, we're going to be talking about lupus, which we both have. We are lupus warriors. So we are going to dive into the story of lupus, your journey with lupus, the amazing work that you're doing in regards to educating other women about lupus. And actually, not only women, I'm sure. You know what? I'm not going to get into it. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Don't want to jump the gun. First, tell me a little bit about yourself. Do you have any hobbies? Give me a little background scoop on Miriam. Um, background scoop. I am the firstborn of four. Um, I'm a first generation Canadian. My parents come from Haiti. Um, I grew up in the church. I married my high school sweetheart. I am a nurse practitioner. I have two kids and a dog. <laughs> and I live in the country in Coburg. Beautiful, beautiful. You married your high school sweetheart. That is yeah. very, very nice. That's be how long you married for? Um, it'll be 12 years, but we've known each other since we were 16. Wow, that's beautiful. Very nice. So now let's talk about lupus. Now let's educate our audience. What is lupus? So lupus is an autoimmune disease in which um, we don't know the actual cause but we do know that it is your immune system attacking any part of the body. Um, there's different types of lupus, but the most common is uh, systemic lupus, erythematosus, SLE, and that is the one that I have. Okay. And now we also know there's a few famous people out there like us, like for example, Nick Cannon and Tony Braxton. She's notoriously talking about it and she doesn't hide it. She puts it out there as she should. And yeah. so it is something that's, it's quite prevalent out there. Oof. As well as DeMar DeRozan for our Raptors fans. I know he does, he's not with the Raptors anymore, mm -hmm. but he too was quite a bit of a, an advocate for lupus as well. Okay, okay, yeah. see, didn't know that. So before you found out that you had lupus, was there anybody in your family that had lupus? Or no, first? not at the time. Um, there's quite a bit of arthritis in the family. Okay. Um, but, you know, everybody has arthritis. You know, yes. They just say their, their joints hurt. So it wasn't really mm -hmm. anything that it was on. I hadn't really known anything about it before. Okay. Beforehand. okay. Yeah. Now, let's just go back a bit. So how did this begin? I mean, you were diagnosed, but what led up to it? What made you, like, give us the backstory. Okay. That's your journey. Um, so back in 2011, I was, I had been newly married, maybe just a year. Um, we were living in Ajax and um, I was in my last year of my nurse practitioner master's program. I was going to, to school at Queens University and I was 
commuting from Ajax to Kingston twice a week. Um, I was working in corrections at the time. I used to work at the old Don jail okay. and um, I was working a compressed work week. So I would work two 14 hour shifts and one 12 hour shift and then going to school twice a week. So I would say I wasn't sleeping all that much mm -hmm. um, and very stressed, um, stressful time. And I had just started to notice that I was getting more food sensitivities that I hadn't really had before, um, like eggplant and tomatoes. Like I was noticing that my, my tongue was getting fuzzy and mm -hmm. just not, my stomach wasn't feeling really uh, well after I would eat and uh, I had gone to see my family doctor and it, the allergy wasn't so severe that it was considered an allergy um, so there was really nothing they could do at that time it was just like avoid eating those things yes. and um, so I had went to see a naturopathic doctor and you know he was talking about lifestyle changes changing the way that you eat and I had just you know he had said Miriam, if you don't change your way that you eat, you're going to end up with an autoimmune disease. And you actually said, like, if you don't change the way you eat, you're going to end up with an auto. Okay. Wow. And, okay. and I was like, listen, I'm only like eight months away <laughs> from <laughs> graduating. I don't have time to change my diet and to really look into this right now. Um, after I'm done my program, I will come back and we can look at this more closely so that must have been in the summer of 2010 Fast let me just forward. stop you there let me just yeah. stop you there for one second so when uh the it was the naturopathic that said this yeah. correct when he or she said this change the way you eat what were you eating like were you eating you know mcdonald's every day i know you're on the no. run and you're so no you um and i'm i and uh, seven day Adventist. So we, mm -hmm. we very much believe in the vegetarian sort of lifestyle. Yes. And um, the only thing I can think of is I had, you know, moved in with my mother in law, and um, there was a lot of like gluten steaks, you know, like this whole thing that was, would, that would be probably one new thing, mm -hmm. which tastes delicious. <laughs> <laughs> They usually um, do catches us, but I was pretty like clean eating. I, well, okay. I you know when you're when you're on the run, a lot of A and W. There was some mm -hmm. fast food stuff, but I was pretty pretty good. Okay, um, it's just I was noticing these changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So then fast forward to like January of 2011, I went and had my hair done and um, had a wet relaxer. My hairstylist wasn't there. I had traveled, you know, all the way downtown. And for the sisters out there, any woman can relate. You, you are more comfortable with the person that you're accustomed to doing. 100%, yes, <laughs> guaranteed. So, you know, she had put the, the product on my hair and it started to burn and it was burning like I've had a burn like from chemicals before but it was a mm -hmm. different kind of burn and I just said you know what you need to take this off like this is really 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 burning and so she did and it was so bad I could not put my head on the headrest of my car it felt like my skin was flayed and like just to touch the hair it was just like current like like you could tell oh. that the nerve endings were so anyways, I went home, I woke up the next morning and all the lymph nodes in my neck were swollen. Oh. All of the lymph nodes in my neck were swollen and it was warm to touch. So of course I'm calling the hair stylist, like, listen, mm -hmm. I don't know what you did, but mm -hmm. there's a problem here. So I went and I saw them they told me to go see a doctor. I went and I saw a doctor. They thought I had a scalp infection. And it just so happened, I had a dermatology appointment booked for um, a lesion that I had. And, you know, I had never seen this dermatologist before. And um, this was at the Albany Medical Clinic um, back then. And so they were on the first floor, first or second floor. And my family doctor was on the third floor and I was supposed to see her first and then go see my family doctor. And um, 
I went to go see her and I just, you know, she was like, yeah, this lesion's fine. And I just said, you know what? I've been started on antibiotics for the scalp infection. I don't feel like it's getting better. If anything, it feels like it's getting worse. Mm-hmm. Can you mind taking a look? And um, she had this thick European accent. And mm-hmm. I remember, and so very blunt. And she knew that I was a nurse. And so she said to me, and I had gone to this appointment on my lunch break mm-hmm. um, at the John jail, which is like not far, just up the this, this street. Yes. With the, the thought that after my appointments, I would go back to work. And um, so she takes a look and she's like, hmm, oh, where do you work? Where do you work again? I said, oh, I work at the Don Jail. Hmm, you know, this could be TB. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> this could be HIV. This oh my could gosh. be cancer. And like, this could be syphilis. And I'm like, what, you know, I was so shocked. I'm like, well, what do you mean? She's like, this, this, is, this is not the scalp infection. And she said to me, you know, especially, you know, working in the jail and all these different things. And so in my head, I'm trying to pick which out of these diseases is the, you know, best of the worst. Mm-hmm. And I'm bawling, like I'm like of course. crying in of the course. office. And she's like, you know, we need to go get some blood work done. And um, so I, I go see my family doctor <laughs> and I'm like a mess. Mm. And he's like, what's wrong? I'm like, this is what they said. Okay, we're going to send you for some blood work. Everything's in the same building. I was able to go for blood work that same day, but I was not in the headspace to go back to work. Of course, especially when someone's telling you TB, cancer, syphilis, HIV, like just from looking at my health. Oh my my goodness. goodness. And they took my temperature and all this time I hadn't realized I was walking around with a low grade fever. Mm. Um, I just thought like, I've got these lymph nodes that are swollen, they're sore and like, I'm just hot, like, because this is uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. when I say they were swollen, they got so bad that I looked like Quasimodo. Like I looked deformed. I couldn't shoulder check. It was so, so swollen. So anyways, that happened earlier in the week. I get a phone call from my family doctor on a Friday and you know, if the doctor's office is calling you, it's usually mm-hmm. not good news. Mm-hmm. Then when you hear your doctor's voice, you know, it's not going to be good, <laughs> good news either. Right. So yeah. the first thing he asked me was like, where are you? I'm like, I'm at home. Okay. What's the closest hospital to you? And wow, I'm that's like, not scary. <laughs> I'm like, Ajax. He's, I'm like, why? He's like, well, I think you need a bone marrow biopsy. And, you know, immediately I'm thinking cancer. I'm like, well, what do you, what do you mean? Like, what, like, and he said, your blood work results came back. Your white blood cell count is one. And it's what? One? One. And wow. typically people's white blood cells are anywhere between four and 11, like, mm-hmm. like to the exponent, like exponent of blah, blah, blah. But mm-hmm. It's not one. So he's, you know, he said to me, your, your white blood cell count is really low, which means your immune system is extremely weak, very compromised, and you need to go to the hospital. You can't sit in the waiting room. You have no immune system. I don't want you to be around um, sick people. Ask them to put you in reverse isolation. You need to, we need further investigation. Now, just for our audience, could you explain what reverse isolation is? So reverse isolation is, it's not, you know, typically they put you in isolation because you're infectious and they don't Mm -hmm. want you to give something to somebody else. So reverse isolation, it's that everybody else is sort of like whatever they might have. I'm the one who's, who's too weak, whose Mm -hmm. immune system is so weak that I could catch anything. Okay. And so they put you in a sterile room and then people gown up so that they're not like making you sick. So typically you see this also with um, patients who have um, cancer who are undergoing like chemo and stuff, mm-hmm. like their immune system will get really low with chemo and they, and they too, if they have to go into the hospital, sometimes they get fevers and stuff, they would put them in reverse isolation as mm-hmm. well. Okay. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to Mount Sinai. Um, and um, so I went there and had a whole bunch of blood work done. 
And initially, you know, lupus was one of the things that they were ruling out. None of my blood work at the time came back positive for lupus. And wow. so now my hair is falling out. And when I say my hair is falling out, I had lots of hair. Like I'm mm -hmm. talking about, like I had lots of hair. Clumps of hair is falling out. I would put my hand through and just, I'm like, you know, handfuls of hair and my joints are aching. I can't even go up a flight of stairs. I'm so weak. I'm so tired. I, you know, I've never felt tired. It was literally like you're walking in mud, like, you know, <laughs> like just that energy. And mm -hmm. I lost 15 pounds, like within oh, a goodness. few weeks. I was and what's going through your mind at this point in time? Like, I'm thinking I'm dying. <laughs> you know, I like that's, that's cancer. That's like the scary part. Oh my god. You know, goodness. I'm thinking I'm dying. I'm thinking like I've, you know, I've been, you know, I just got married. I was prioritizing school and, mm -hmm. um, you know, not spending time, making all this sacrifice, not spending time with my family and, you know, regret. Mm. I'm like, I'm going to have to write, and I'm thinking of writing letters to each member mm -hmm. of my family, like, I was oh, just goodness. so wow. emotional, so of they course, had told me, <laughs> they had told me they wanted to do an aspiration um, lymph nodes, where they, like, they put a needle in the lymph node, and they take the fluid, and they go and analyze it, okay, so I went and had that done, and I went to go get the results. So when I went to get the results, the doctor had said to me, you know, the results came back inconclusive. So we're gonna need to send you for a lymph node biopsy. I said, okay, where, oh, we're sending you to Princess Margaret. So I was like, oh. Oh my gosh. So now you're <laughs> definitely thinking you have cancer. So I'm in, it's just reinforcing oh. this, that, you know, that I have cancer and not, they're not telling me like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, what? And so I was like, why are you sending me to Princess Margaret? Mm -hmm. if you don't think I have cancer and he was just like no that's where the ENT uh, specialist is that does th these type of um, biopsies and he's just works at it there and that's why we're going to refer you there okay. now he knows I'm a healthcare professional mm -hmm. I asked for a copy of all of my results so I didn't look at them inside of inside of his office I just asked for a copy he said you know you can get it from the secretary in the front Mm -hmm. this would be a good time for him to explain what was written in the results. So now I'm going, I went to this appointment by myself. I wasn't anticipating getting any bad news. And, and I think I, so yeah, I was afraid, but I also was in denial, you mm -hmm. know, like I have to be positive, of course. you know, you know, like, you know, and then, so yeah. now I'm sitting yeah. in the car and I'm opening up this result and it says non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, versus necrotizing uh, lymphadenitis. So I just start bawling. I'm like, need lymph node biopsy to confirm. So oh, I'm like hold on a crying. second. So they're both cancer, is it not? No, so um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is cancer. And then this mm -hmm. other one, I didn't know what it was when I first read it, but I saw okay. necrotizing, which is what we see with like dead cells flesh eating disease they'll use like okay. so I'm okay. thinking oh my gosh this sounds bad <laughs> you know like um which is really it's just um it's like an infl like a lot of inflammation causing cell death and um so it's but it's self-limiting it'll get better eventually on its own Okay. So, you know, okay. at this point, you know, you're going on Google, you're like checking yes. everything. I'm pulling up the medical books. I'm like, you mm -hmm. know, searching everything and praying that it's not cancer. Of course. And now you're by um, yourself at this point. I was by myself. So okay. now when I see this result, now I'm just like, okay, like, and I'm calling everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went for the lymph node biopsy. And my husband is a police officer. Mm -hmm. I was a police officer back then. He wasn't a police officer back then. So they had done the surgery, but they didn't come and speak to me afterwards. They gave him all of the care okay. <laughs> um, package. And I remember mm -hmm. this because it was like, you know, you wake up by yourself and you're like, you know, wait, your partner's there. And then you're asking them, what did they say? Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, <you> know? <laughs> they said something. <laughs> Oh, here's the papers, you know. Yeah, like, you can you can tell me what it says. 
<laughs> You're the nurse practitioner. Yeah, you know, I was just like, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was the way that it was sutured. I couldn't shoulder check. I couldn't turn my head. And um, I couldn't sleep on that side. And it mm -hmm. took six months for me to regain full strength. Wow. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. That just is just part of the journey. But I finally <laughs> got the result of the, the biopsy. And it was like, you know, it came back with mixed um, connective tissue disease, which is consistent with lupus. So when he said that to me, I was like, lupus. Hmm. Oh, you know, the initial was like this relief. Oh, okay. And then mm -hmm. you're thinking about what do you know? Okay, well, I know there's no cure. But it's, I know this isn't as bad as cancer. Um, yeah. And so I was started on high dose prednisone. And now, um, quick question. Yeah. You said that origi originally it was ruled out, was it not? Yes. So they okay. had done. So this is so here's the thing, too. So with lupus, when they make the diagnosis of lupus, one of the reasons why they call it the, the, the disease of a, a thousand faces is that you can have a thousand people who have lupus, but they have different symptoms. Yes. It manifests okay. very differently. Mm -hmm. And some people could have this antibody that's positive, but have these different symptoms and other people might not have that. But mm -hmm. over the course of the disease, they might develop these um, antibodies that would test positive, which gotcha. didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think initially they had done the ANA, which mm -hmm. was um, negative initially. Okay. And then it turned positive. And then with this biopsy, everything, you know, it just sort of confirmed with all of the symptoms that I had that this was lupus. Gotcha. I remember when, when I, sorry, what was that? No, I said, I understand. I got you. Yeah. I remember when I was referred to see the rheumatologist at that time and he, she was telling me, oh, you have mild lupus. I was like, mild. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Is there such a thing? I'm like, what is my? <laughs> I don't think you understand. I had to walk here from the parking lot, and this was you're drained, very you hard. Have no strength, you're achy, but that's mild. So, what's full blown lupus like? Okay. <laughs> when I guess the way that they defined um, the severity of this, the disease has to do with the organ involvement which or organs have been um, affected. And at the time okay. I didn't have any, you know, kidney um, involvement and other organs involved. Um, so that's why they had called it. Mild, gotcha. Mild. Okay, okay. Um, but that wasn't explained um, mm. at the time that I had, you know, figured that out like with the research and everything. Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously you don't feel like it's mild. Um, but oh. no. So after I had that diagnosis and I was started on the medications, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, am I going to be on this for the rest of my life? Like, I just got married. I want to have kids. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember at some point my li liver enzymes um, were really, really high and mm -hmm. um, my liver enzymes were really, really high. And so, but I still at no point was I, you know, given the whole conversation about, you know, you should wait on having pregnancy, um, getting mm -hmm. pregnant, um, make sure your disease is stable. Um, I really- Does lupus typically, does lupus typically um, affect the process of, of having children? Like does, does it make it more difficult or- so pregnancy is actually a huge stressor on a woman's body and in lupus in particular it can cause a flare-up um, okay. of lupus and so this is why they want your your disease to be really stable before mm -hmm. you get pregnant okay and um depending on what antibodies are positive some of the, the antibodies that are positive can increase your likelihood of miscarriage mm. um and then in my case, one of the, the antibodies that were positive can cause um, fetal heart block in mm -hmm. um, the fetus. So I was like preparing, I was like, okay, my plan is to be on this medication for a couple of years, to get off the medication, have um, children, but to really like 
get in the best shape of my life because I mm-hmm. don't want to. Um, obviously, you're scared because everybody's disease journey is very different, mm-hmm. and you know you hear a lot of not so happy endings. Um, yes. So that's what I went back to the naturopathic doctor. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm on these medications. I'm ready to listen. Like, what do you want me to do? And it makes sense. You know, all of these digestive issues and, and um, sensitivities, these things cause inflammation in the body mm-hmm. when you keep on exposing yourself to foods that aren't agreeing with you. It's, yeah. a, it's a small piece of the bigger puzzle, of course. Um, but I just, I changed my entire diet. And um, at the time I was- Another quick to- question for you. Let me just cut yeah. you off. Another quick question. Yeah. Now, by all means, I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor. This is just for, just for knowledge's yeah. sake. So I don't want anybody, you know, going on and taking themselves off medication or anything. No, but, no, no, no. No, we're not And doing this that. was then with my doctor, um, with the, the consultation of my doctor, and because at the time I went up north and I started to work on a, a remote indigenous reserve. So I wasn't going to have the same access to mm-hmm. my specialist. And of okay. course, I don't, you know, I didn't want to be coming off any kind of medication without their, um, what's the word, without their, uh, you know, support. Okay. And um, not only support, but having that close access as well. Mm-hmm. I was in a fly-in community. Yeah. So it's not like I could like, you know, take the plane the next mm-hmm. day and go see them. So um, you were able to come off the so prednisone? No, for sure. You were able to come off the prednisone yeah. with, with the system, right. medical system. Right. Okay. And this was, and you know, <laughs> talking about prednisone, I think I had gotten down to two milligrams Wow. And, you know, in, in my head, I'm like, well, I can go from two milligrams to zero. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this is no problem. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if you know, it can happen. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, he said I could taper, but you know what? I'll just do my, no, I went and I was, went from two milligrams to zero and I woke up the next day. I couldn't get out of bed. I was like, oh my like, gosh. Yeah. And I called him and, you know, the adrenal, your adrenal glands aren't working the same way. Mm-hmm. And I went back on that medication quick, quick, because mm-hmm. I was I was like, no. So definitely, you know, you need to have the support of your of your doctors. You don't want to be playing around with things. Yes. And um I mean no prednisone know, is a nice thought. I mean I would love no prednisone, but unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, and I don't know. I'm a food person. I love mm-hmm. to cook and to, but I found when I was on prednisone, I was dreaming of food. Like I could oh my gosh. smell the food. <laughs> I would wake up early and make myself elaborate breakfast. And oh my goodness, I, yeah, I was, I was, I was already a person that if you know, if I get hungry, I get hangry. But with prednisone, yes. that was like <laughs> that was that's, next level. That's me. <laughs> That, right? that was completely me. <laughs> completely, I completely I, understand. I to say that has yep. changed, but it has mm-hmm. not. I'm still, I'm still very much the same <laughs> way. Um, but I do remember I was dreaming of food. Um, so yeah. I, you know, I tried to, you know, because of prednisone and the increase. Um, chances of diabetes and stuff mm-hmm. and weight gain. I was trying to stay fit and, mm-hmm. but you get the, you know, the moon face yes. and all of these things yep. that, that certainly bring a lot of insecurity mm-hmm. um, that people point out, which isn't very helpful. Not at um, all. Not at all. <laughs> no. I was walking around looking like I was at least like four months pregnant. At yeah. least four, oh gosh, four months pregnant. I was eating, snacking. I don't, I don't snack at three, four o'clock in the morning. That's not my thing. When I was doing right. I did that all the time back then. I was on yeah. high doses, like 60 milligrams. I yeah. was on high doses, 120 at one point. I was wow. huge. And now wow. if I look back on pictures, I was just like, damn. Yeah. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I just completely. You don't that realize when you're in it, but the, to your point, when you look at the pictures, you're just like, mm-hmm. wow. Like, yes. You, you don't even look the same, right? Like, Not at all. Not at all. So. Um, and then at the same time, you think of, I think of all the pain and discomfort 
you know, mm-hmm. with that, if we didn't have prednisone and these medications, like, no, like, it's true. Would, like it would be awful. Very true. Um, so now so, you said that you went away and you yes. said that, I'm sorry, where did you say you went? What was that? I went up to Attawapiskat actually. Okay. Um, okay. Which is a, a First Nations reserve on the coast, off the coast of James Bay. Okay. And um, just, you know, planning to go for a couple of years. I was there for almost five. Oh. Um, and I really believe like, you know, sometimes in the, in the acts of healing others and helping others, serving others, you heal yourself. You heal yourself, 100%, it's true. And it was definitely a life-changing experience. Um, It was very hard to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, But how did you feel though, when you're out there, how did you feel? Did you feel any of the symptoms? Did you feel like the stiff joints or was it just uh, literally just? No, even the air. Because like mm. I had so many like allergies, environmental allergies down here. And I don't know if it was the pollution or whatever. Mm-hmm. Up there, I had no allergies. I had so no allergies. The air is just, I don't even know how to explain it. I'm not an outdoors person. I was up mm-hmm. there hiking. You know, I went out on the bay. You mm-hmm. know, I did a whole bunch of, I really felt like spiritually, I felt that much closer to God. You know, That's like, beautiful. you know, some you know, and then some people call the outdoors God's cathedral. And I can mm-hmm. really feel that up there. Like there's only one store right up there. Okay. Like there's no, there's no cinema <laughs> <laughs> shopping. Everything is like in the same store. So you have <laughs> to find, um, so you make the, the friends and people you meet there become family. And okay. um, it really showed me a different way of living and the importance of connection. Um, and wow. like, yeah, it was, yeah. And I love, I ended up living winter and oh, I wow. like winter. Winter yeah. up there is beautiful. And the air, like, you know how down here, like it's cold and you can feel it in your bones. Like mm-hmm. it's that damp. It's a, it's more of a dry cold up there. So you okay. like, I'm like parka, like I yes. can't feel the cold, you know, like yes. up there, but so I would be going out on walks and like, it was, yeah, it was really That's amazing. Good. Yeah. That's amazing. It was a complete reset. You went, like you said, you went to help others and instead you ended up healing and helping yourself. Yes, definitely. Wow. Definitely. And so after going through that experience, I just said to myself, you know what? Um, I felt the litmus test was going to be my pregnancies. Um, you know, I did get followed by sick kids and, um, initially the high risk OB and, um, because of the, the fetal heart block and I've had two low risk pregnancies. I haven't had a flare up of my disease and I just, you know, I realized that, yeah, I realized that like my mission and this is, so this is how I came up with manage your lupus clinic. Mm -hmm. My mission is to help other women and other men um, better manage their condition, become more self-aware, better advocate for themselves Mm -hmm. and support their loved ones in supporting them. You know, some days, like most, you know, sometimes you don't look sick. Right. And people just think that, you know, okay, she's faking it. Mm -hmm. Like it can't be that bad. Um, And, you know, one of the, like you'll see on social media, they'll say make lupus visible. Um, And a lot, a lot of that has to do with that. You know, you have good days and you have bad days. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit more about that. Let's talk about, you know, manage your lupus. So you just decided just on your own that you wanted to help educate others about lupus or you just want to share your journey further and the knowledge that you have as a no I just found I don't regret my diagnosis because I feel Mm -hmm. like it was a a huge turning point um it forced me to reevaluate what was the most important and um put the energy towards the things I love, the people mm-hmm. that I love, and being more intentional 
um, about those things. Like spiritually, you know, I do believe in God. I do feel that faith and, you know, research supports that, that people that have some kind of faith doesn't, you know, whether it doesn't matter what it is that you believe in, that people who have some kind of faith based practice, that it does help with um, any type of disease. And um, and then trauma, like I had, mm-hmm. I had a, a lot of unresolved trauma that I had to deal with and that came up in my pregnancies and stuff, mm-hmm. um, that a lot of, you know, there's not a person I think on this planet that hasn't had some kind of traumatic experience. Of course. Um, and, some, and, you know, now we're, we're a lot bigger in mental health and these different mm-hmm. things. But I think we're just understanding more. There's a lot of literature and, and research that supports the fact that there's a link between unresolved trauma and autoimmune disease. Okay. And I feel like sometimes what happens, like my my way, how I see it is like these things that you keep bottled in, up inside literally are eating away at you. Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, yes. your body starts to show it. Mm -hmm. And your body's giving you signs and symptoms and things for you to sort of like, maybe it's time for you just to really deal with, deal with it. Make a change, look into it. Make a change. Something. Yes. Agreed. Um, So when I saw how well I was able to sort of manage and navigate my illness, it just became a a natural mission for me to want to share that with others. My mother ended up being diagnosed with lupus. Um, oh, a, year, okay. a few years after me okay and um and you know of course you're gonna help your loved ones and stuff mm-hmm. like that but I just felt like you know we each have a mission and purpose in life and I really felt that I'm very passionate about um about this mm-hmm. and I just feel like there's so much more that can be done of and course. lupus awareness um in Canada is you know it's getting there like May mm-hmm. is Lupus Awareness Month mm-hmm. um but there's so much more that we can be doing well you um, are doing a lot um just right now I'm gonna show everybody the the brochure the flyer for Manage Your Lupus which is an eight-week seminar correct yes right so let's talk about that within the eight weeks what do our what our wonderful Miriam educates everybody with um, regarding these eight weeks So eight weeks, we're going to talk about, you know, what are the different types of lupus, Mm -hmm. but also sort of having people also think and reflect about their own story and their journey, that sort of reflective process. So what was happening in your life during this time, like the Mm -hmm. good, the bad, and the ugly, sort of like conceptualizing your story. So going through the different types of lupus, um, then I think... Then we're also going to talk about reproductive health and lupus. Um, Some of the things you need to know if you're planning to have children, um, there's some medications that can cause um, infertility, you know, planning. We know that one in two pregnancies, 50% of pregnancies are not planned. Yes. So when you have lupus, you especially need to be planning for that because Mm -hmm. it can make your a lot worse. Yes. Um, and then, and that's not only for women, but also for men as well, like in terms of um, infertility and, and these different things. So we're going to talk about that. We have a rheumatologist who will be coming in and speaking to us about um, what is an active flare-up of the, of the disease. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? And then when you're in remission, I think sometimes that we don't appreciate a flare-up of our disease may not show up in the same way that it did the first time. And so really um, gaining some more knowledge and understanding about what are the other symptoms that we need to be watchful for um, so that if when we do see it, we're having that conversation with our doctors right away and not allowing it to sort of get out of hand. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we have a week where we have a registered holistic nutritionist is going to be talking about um, the relationship between food and autoimmune disease, um, preventative medicine, and um, like in terms of what we eat. Um, And we have a naturopathic doctor that's going to be talking about the implications of stress and autoimmune disease and how that 
um, re relationship coexist and why yes. that's not good in, yes. in uh, any type of disease or for anyone. Yeah, and stress, then, that's, that's huge. Yeah. Huge to have lupus too, really right? good. Yes, it's true. Yeah. And then the final one is sort of like the big take home message is like, okay, so we've talked about all of these different things. Um, let's look at where do we go from here? What are the things that, you know, over the last eight weeks, do you feel that um, you could probably work on that you want to go and talk to your um, provider about? Um, is there any, we're going to also talk about mental health, because the truth of the matter is, it's hard not to be anxious and not to worry and not to feel depressed. And then you're um, anxious and you're worried and then you're stressed. That just causes everything to just go haywire and your lupus. And life doesn't before. stop, right? Yeah. Like your responsibilities don't go away. Exactly. You might have a mortgage, like you might have, um, you might be a caregiver for mm -hmm. elderly parents or for children, like or there's all these other things, right? Like yep, that's a lot. In a, a relationship, like there's all of these <laughs> things that, um, so this is why it's important for not just lupus warriors to attend, but also their loved ones and people who are supporting um, lupus warriors because mm -hmm. they're the ones who are with us throughout that journey and they can make things a lot easier for us. And yeah. I think that's what they want to do. They want to help. And I think sometimes we just, we don't even know how to ask our loved ones to help. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having that knowledge is certainly gonna help um, mm -hmm. with the, the journey and that's I a lot you're packing into eight weeks there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that is a lot. Oh, so this is why it's eight weeks. But and how much does this all cost? So Taibu is sponsoring the entire thing. Oh, so you're yes. saying it's free. It's free. And there's we, they're providing TTC tokens for people as well. If people wow. um, and child minding, if you have any children over the age of two, we will have somebody um, there to, to um, take care of your kids. So we're trying to make it as accessible as possible. It's accessible, friendly, yeah. as well as if you need any interpretation or, or translation, we will get somebody to come and translate. So there is no reason well. not to go. Like you exactly. have everything covered, childcare, transportation, it's free. <laughs> like there's no reason not to go. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. Where is it, where is it gonna be located? So it's at Taibu, which is 27 Tapscott Unit 1. So it's right by the Malvern Mall. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful place. And uh, I can't, it starts next week. So Excellent. slots are limited. Mm -hmm. um, but if people are, are wanting to go, I would encourage them to go to the website at managerlupus.com. And there's a form there. It will ask you about if you need transportation, um, like TTC tokens or child minding, it will ask you all those questions. Beautiful. And I hope to see everyone there, whoever can, whoever can come. And that I hope it's not, I don't, it won't be the, the only one, we'll, we will also be providing another um, workshop in French as well. Excellent. Oh, wow. That is, yeah. you guys thought of everything. <laughs> My goodness, that's <laughs> wonderful. That is great. Wow, well, I'm sure it's gonna be success. I'm sure it's going to be a success regardless. And people that are turn out, come up with lots of questions and, you know, just get educated. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's, that's the hope. And I'm really, really excited to be partnering with Taibu to be doing this. Yes. They're a great organization as well. Yeah. Amazing. Miriam, you are definitely a warrior in every sense of the word. You've been through you know, the ups and downs and you came through standing strong, beautiful as ever. You're amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Like I said, you know, I'm glad we connected and you're able to share your story on the Green Table Talk because it's definitely something that's worth sharing. And like I said, I'm sure your, your seminar is going to be a success. And I look forward to seeing what else you have in store for us because this is just the beginning for you. Thank you and um, thank you for having me and I, I really hope that um, you know if, if anyone feels inspired or feels like getting getting some more information that they know where to come and um, maybe they're not able to make it this session please still fill out the form so that we can 
we can still have an idea that there are still more people that would like to attend and so that we can plan for future events as well. Excellent. That's beautiful. So this is the part in the show where I usually share a little nugget of knowledge, just some knowledge and wisdom. And your story has just brought out the one that everybody knows the saying, but I thought it just fits very well. Today's nugget, nugget of nugget of knowledge is knowledge is power. So you went through your journey. You decided to take that, educate others, because if you got, you went through it, I've been through it. There are others out there who's been through it, but you didn't just sit there and wait. You educated yourself. You got yourself more information. You're taking this information. You're sharing it to the masses. And I mean, there's nothing better than that. Knowledge is power. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Of course. And thank you for joining us on the Green Table Talk. And we'll see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.